I believe everyone has a story to tell. And I believe everyone deserves a little pampering. Welcome to Manny's with Grannies. I'm your host, Tiffany Marino. Join me while I sit down with a woman over 70 and get to know her while giving her a manicure. For today's episode of Manny's with Grannies, I am with Dee Dee Tucker in her beautiful home in downtown Warren. Dee Dee, thank you for having me at your house today. You're very welcome. <laughs> so when we got here, you said that you've lived here for 14 years? In this house, yes. And it's painted beautifully on the outside and decorated so nicely here on the inside. Did it look like this when you moved in? Oh, no. Everything was beige. Inside, outside, rugs, everything. I'm a color person, so I spent a lot of time getting rid of beige. <laughs> How did you decide to paint the outside the, the way it is? Lowe's had historic preservation color palettes, and I went there because the house was built in 1853. Okay, so did you go into the history of the house before you started renovating it? Um, it came with its original blueprints, and it was a Putnam house before it was, and then it was sold to somebody else. But it was built, the original was built in 1853, added on in 1880. Probably didn't have a kitchen inside because they were terrified of fire. So it was probably detached and like in the yard. There was a carriage, you know, you could tie your horse up. Nobody had stables in town because you just went to the livery or you walked everywhere, took the trolley. And then it was added on to in 1921, the most recent. Were your kids grown by the time you moved into this house? Yes, we we lived when we got married, we lived on Second Avenue then we, you know, various apartments, and then we moved to Water Street, and then we got exiled to Erie by Bill's company for seven years. You can cry from here to Erie without a problem and never stop, and then we were there for seven years, and then he retired early, and we came back. While you were raising kids, did you have a job? Um, I did tons of different jobs until I had Emily until Emily came I worked with um, the school district as a special ed teacher and then after M came I did lots of things tutored we did we were very poor when we first got married but we really wanted to have the kids have our personality so we kind of we swapped out i'd work at night and he'd work during the day so we didn't have to pay a babysitter because we couldn't afford to it was it was a good job and so then i didn't have to work so i just volunteered tons of volunteer stuff what kind of volunteer work oh warren literacy council bill and i were um the on the starting committee for habitat for humanity in warren county can't remember what they called it something house it was on pennsylvania avenue down by where jarvis is and it was six churches and it, it was for homeless families instead of just homeless people and i worked there for a long time helped out always with the church always and now i do the toy shop tell me about the toy shop um the toy shops on the state hospital grounds their mission statement is that they do quality wooden toys for underprivileged kids. And right now we have 16 carpenters. That's a lot. And we have about 12 to 14 ladies that paint. Although some of our carpenters are ladies, a couple of them, the one, the one that makes puzzles. And a couple of guys like to paint their own stuff. They don't, you know, they like to do the whole thing from start to finish, but we make tons and tons of about 14 to 1600 toys a year. Wow. That is a lot. I don't, I don't paint and I don't carpenter. I'm the organizer person. So I do all the inventory of all the wood, all the wheels, all the 
anything we need, dowels, you know, garbage bags. And I um, have a sample of every toy that we make on the shelf. And then the pattern is hung up over on a pegboard. And so the guys will come to me and they'll say, after a while, they'll say, what do you need? And then I'll tell them, you know, I need doll beds or I need whatever. And they'll pick which which one they want to make and get the pattern and get the sample and take it back to their workbench. And then what do you do with the toys once they're made? Once they're made, they come back to me again and I inspect them to make, if they're a pull toy, they have to have the cord can't be too long because it has to be, you know, standards for this country. And then um, there's a little... I don't know. It's a little cube and no part on the toy can be smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go with yeah, smaller. Yeah. So it can't be swallowed. And and mm -hmm. so I inspect all that, stamp it with our stamp, okay. and then put it on the shelf ready for distribution. What's the mission for the toy shop? You guys give toys away to the kids of Warren? Warren County. And well, when I got there... I'm, I think eight or nine years ago, maybe 10 years ago, this is bad. And if any of them are listening, oh, well, it was <laughs> guy organized <laughs> and, and they, they just randomly, I mean, you know what? It was December 15th. They made little heaps of toys and distributed it to seven or eight agencies. But I go all over um, the county and try to get people they needed the woman's touch yeah, to well, maybe <laughs> to <laughs> they organize them. they tolerate me <laughs> you know at first it was really difficult i think for them to have cuz that was their area and uh -huh. it's a huge place it's it's the best kept secret in Warren i think so it's really neat what did you do to uh help them accept you into their I crew kill them with kindness if I found a really quality piece of wood, I'd deliver it to their desk. <laughs> I baked brownies. And plus, I had my husband for a buffer. So that was great because he did everything that nobody else would do. Because what choice did he have, really? So your husband is was involved in the toy shop also? Yes. Yes. Well, actually, I begged the old a couple old guys at the church. He told me he was going to retire. He was 53. And I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do with him? <laughs> and so for two years, I, I bugged the couple older guys at our church that worked at the toy shop. I said, ask Bill, ask Bill, ask Bill. So he finally went and he really liked it. And then that I kind of invaded his space. So Bill is no longer with us. Is that right? Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that. That's OK. Oh been two years every day but our anniversary our 50th anniversary is coming up and i don't know i figure it's always going to be okay it's never going to be any worse now but <laughs> you know you keep thinking can there be better <laughs> probably but he was my person he was we met he was only 14 and, and I had just turned 17. He turned 15 two weeks later. But he loved it when we would um, go for homecoming at, at War Memorial Field. And I would have to go to the older table to sign up. He told me when he was 16 he was going to marry me. I told him he was crazy. Did that for like three or four years. Finally wore me down. To figure <laughs> so... <laughs> Man. So we never were really apart ever. Do you remember how you got engaged? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was at Edinburgh and he was going to um, JCC for business. He took a two year degree so he could graduate at the same time as me because he wanted to get married. And so he came to Edinburgh as Valentine's Day, proposed at one of the nicer restaurants there, got down on his knee and the whole bit. It was cute. And he bought our wedding bands and he showed them to his parents and his parents were wonderful. They, of course, they're older. 
even than my parents because they they all you know did the war thing and my mom's for I wouldn't even be here my mom's first husband died in the war and then she married my dad so she was 29 when she had me Bill's mom was 36 when she had him because she you know the dating pool was poor after the war and she she they got married oh just a little bit three days before her 35th birthday I think because she said I was going to be another year older before I got married but anyways he shows the rings to his parents and he he said, I got a really good deal because the jewelry store is closing. And his dad said to him, they were opening when I bought your mom's ring there. So that was special. Wow, that's full yeah. circle. Yeah. Oh, that's a really nice story. Yeah. And we got married in the same church they did. And we met there at the church. That's my mother thought, she thought I read too much and I needed to get out of my shell and I need to socialize. And I was just a bookworm. You know, there were jocks, there were the music kids, there were the intellectual kids. I guess I was that. But what was Bill? Bill, what, oh, he's a music geek. He loved music, played all through high school, went to district band and orchestra. Played in the Civi Orchestra in Warren and, and two or three different bands um, in Jamestown. So that turned out to be my only free nights after, <laughs> after he retired was when he went to music practice. What did you wear for your wedding? Oh, don't even. Um, my mother didn't want us to get married. She didn't, you know, she thought we were too young. She didn't. My dad was five years younger than she was. He was not a romantic like her first husband. Her first husband was, they're all dead nice. So we can talk all we want about them. But and my sisters and brothers agree with me anyways. So that was her sole basis. I, I think Earl was a real romantic. They were only married for 18 months when he, he went went to war and she was a very stubborn person and she just got in her head that if the guy was younger than the girl that it wasn't going to work out really well and so she pushed me to date other people it was the first time I ever actually told her no as as you know I was pretty docile being the first kid you are and my brothers and sisters were happy to tell her no, but I, I just never did. And so she didn't want us to get married. We were going to anyway. And so she didn't want to pay for anything, which was fine. Well, we didn't have two dimes to rub together. We had school bills and everything, but I didn't care. I was, I didn't, you know, I would have made do, but then we published in the paper because you did back then, you know, that we were getting married. And then she was highly insulted. She goes, well, this makes it sound like I don't approve. And, and I got really gutsy. And I said, well, you don't. <laughs> and she said, you have to go retract that. You have to. And then she started fishing around. So I got to wear my cousin's wedding gown. Now it's June and Warren. My cousin had gotten married in wisconsin in december <laughs> so it was a very hot day let's just say that <laughs> but anyways i didn't get me the most romantic person on earth did not get to keep the gown or anything and she managed to lose the negatives to the wedding uh-huh so no wedding photos well there there are a few <laughs> do you know if anyone wore the dress after you no i have no idea it got scooped up and sent back. Now, my mom, my mom's dress was there, but we never talked about Earl. 
ever. Uh, I don't know if it was because of my dad. I knew stuff and she would, in her hope chest, of course, which was from high school, she would show me the last letter that he wrote her and the telegram that informed her that, you know, he was missing in action and then died. And for our first anniversary, though, she gave, they must have been able to recover his remains. I think he's buried in France or maybe Alsace Lorraine. I don't know. Um, Alsace Lorraine is where he was killed, and my sister's name is Lorraine. So Lori and I figured all this out a long time later. But, anyways, um, so my mom's wedding dress was in that hope chest, and it's beautiful. I think she loved my dad enough that she didn't want to insult him by dragging that because their marriage was, you know, a courthouse affair with her in a 1940s suit that was very fitted and I'm sure quite elegant at the time. But she did finally when my Megan was being baptized. She gave me the gown to make into a baptismal gown for, for Meg. So. And did you do that? Yes. Did you make it yourself? Yes. I made all the girls' clothes for years. How did you learn how to sew? Mom. She sewed a lot. You know, her grandmother sewed and her, you know, everybody did back then. Did you teach your daughters? Yes. What does passing that talent and legacy on mean to you? Uh, well, you know, they, they have varying degrees. And you have talents within the sewing range, too, because, you know, just because you knew needlework doesn't mean you do it all. Just because you quilt doesn't mean you do mm. every kind of quilting. Just because you sew doesn't mean you like to make garments. And um, so... I'm glad that they enjoy the parts that they chose to do. They all have the ability to sew on a button or mend a pair of jeans, and they know better to show up in something that's, you know, really trailing when mom's around. But, you know, I just let them do their own thing. And they're more talented than I am in some stuff. So... It just depends. But I remember my mom's sewing machine sat in a bay window. She would open the window. Of course, no screens back then. So I could have fallen out at any time. <laughs> but um, I would sit there by the hour and watch her sew. And, she, and with four kids, you only got to sew every once in a while. <laughs> but she was so late into the night. She made doll clothes, fantastic doll clothes. My grandchildren have the doll clothes that she made still, some of them. That's so nice. And, and somehow, you know, Santa brought the very same stuff that she made, but you never knew. My dad would get us lunatic presents. Like we lived halfway, uh, like a fourth of a mile up Follett Run. The driveway was gravel. The driveway was probably like maybe two worn city blocks long to get back to the barn. <laughs> so... And the, again, let me say, the driveway's gravel. My dad shows up for Easter one year with his rusted out scooter. You know, not scooters like they have now. Those big old fat wheels. And it was, it was a horrible, nasty blue color. And he spray painted it. And we never knew that Santa had the same spray paint. You know, we were just <laughs> yeah. clueless children. And the four of us, we never argued who got to use the scooter because you just like push and push and push and then you go two inches. And then you push and push and push and you go two inches. But then that, that was a gentler time. Follett Run did not have the traffic it does now. The state police went up, up, up over the Preston Road. So Lori and I were never stupid like my brothers were, but we could get them to do anything. And <laughs> we put them on a scooter at the top of this hill. No brakes, no way to stop. They just, their little 
Red Bull cans. <laughs> they have no rubber on them. My mama called. We just bought these. These have to last all summer. Well, she didn't know that they were trying to save their lives <laughs> as they came down the hill. And Lori and I would always stand down by the mailbox and go, we'll catch you. And you know, the faster they came down there, the more we thought, this is not a good plan. So we just step out of the way. Well, then the road kind of leveled off. But we always assured them that if any vehicles came, we would let them know. But you didn't have to worry about it because all the dads had the cars at work during the day. Nobody went up and down until it was quitting time. So. It sounds like fun times. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Car trips were the best. My parents would go home. They were from Wisconsin. And they, quote, went home. And mom would take the four of us on the train. And then we would stay there for a month. And we were the youngest of my mom's brothers and sisters were tons older than her. Um, she had one that was 22 years older than her and they all had five, six, 12, eight kids. So we have dozens and dozens of cousins, none of which we knew because we only saw them when we went home for two weeks every summer. Then my dad would drive and, and get us. They always had a big black Buick and that's before car seats. They just mm -hmm. fling you in the back. And, and I always got swapped because I was the tallest and, and the oldest. And no matter what they did, it was my fault because I couldn't contain them. <laughs> And how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have four. I was 10 years older than um, my youngest brother, five years older than my middle brother, and 18 months older than my sister. So your sister and you grew up pretty close? You kind of ran the whole neighborhood. They didn't have cul-de-sacs. I mean, there wasn't Pleasant Township. There wasn't places like that around Warren, it was very much more rural. And we just ran on Fall It Run. I mean, we could be anywhere. We knew every kid there, rode the bus with all of them, and just, you know, we'd get together in the morning after chores, figure out what we were going to do, ran as a little herd, hung out wherever. We weren't allowed in unless there was blood, so... You know, that's how it went. We had a farm, which a lot of the other kids didn't have. So they, they would, 48 acres is a lot of leeway. Did you have to help take care of the farm? Yeah. They had to milk the cows. And I, I would do, I would have done anything. I would have shoveled manure for centuries to get out and take care of those nasty chickens. We had a chicken coop and we had a goat. My sister always insisted on a horse and thought she was very special on her pony. We call it a pony. <laughs> she called it a horse, but whatever. We, we really didn't get to do any extracurricular activities because with only one car and with the age rage spread, when I got old enough, maybe 10 or 12, I got to have a library card. It was it was wonderful. So I would you could only take you could take out twelve books. So every Friday I would get twelve books and bring them home, and they'd be, you know sometimes they'd be done before the next Friday. But I did my best. I started with the A's and was reading through at the library. <laughs> what? My brothers and sisters had no interest in that. What do you think reading did for you that you loved it so much? Oh, escape from taking care of my brothers and sisters. Um, got a quarter an hour for babysitting, and that whole entire road wanted you to babysit because back then when you babysat, nobody had a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. You had to wash the dishes. You did any laundry with a ringer machine, hung it up, pegged it up. You cleaned the house. Whatever 
whatever, you did it for the family you were babysitting for. And it cracked me up, this one family. I won't name names because <laughs> the kids are still in town. They're grown up. But they um, they had six kids. And Lori and I, we'd flip a coin. They weren't bad kids. We had bad kids, but they weren't. It was so funny because you got a quarter an hour. Then when the kids went to bed, so after midnight, and the parents always stayed out because they very rarely got to stay out, then you got 50 cents an hour. <laughs> what is the logic in this? You know, It's crazy. But I don't know. 50 cents went a long way. Mm -hmm. then doesn't now but my grandmother used to send me um when i was in edinburgh she every week she would send me a dollar and a dollar just went a long 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 way i mean you could buy i could buy stamps i could buy a big pen. I could get a slice of pizza. I could do all this stuff with a dollar. Thinking about your parents, what do you think is one of the most important things they taught you? Um, hard work, I think, probably for my dad. He worked hard, but I think it was to escape the chaos that was her house. <laughs> but, um, and he really, I mean, mom did all the, she did all the discipline. She was in charge and he let her be. It didn't, you know, bother him that much. But one time he came home from work. He was working overtime because he always worked third shift. And he came home and she said, she had told us, she had informed us that we were going to be in trouble when he got home. You know, a very night, very leave it to beaver kind of life apron, you know, the, the nylons with the seam up the back and her getting ready for her husband to come home and her to impress him with the food she made and blah, blah. <laughs> and the porch was our domain. I mean, we hung out. It was a big front porch and I had it set up as a school, much to my siblings. You know, they hated that, but I taught school all the time to them, whether they liked it or not. It's just probably why they didn't cooperate. We had a huge mud pie kitchen out back that we collected and sifted stuff, caught crayfish, you know, herded the cows, did all that stuff. But <laughs> My dad comes home, he comes out on the porch and he looks at us and he said, I don't know what you did. My dad was huge. He, he had giant, giant hands. And he said, so here's what we're going to do. He's talking real low. And he says, I'm going to lap four times really loud and you guys are going to scream <laughs> we say okay so he grabs his great big hands and slaps him on his thigh and we screamed bloody murder <laughs> and i don't nobody knows what we were punished for that day still <laughs> could have might have been that we gave my baby brother a quarter to hang on to the electric fence until we counted <laughs> to the five might have been that. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Sounds like you guys were uh, some troublemakers, maybe. Actually, we were the good kids in the neighborhood. We, they were kids we weren't allowed to hang out with because they were troublemakers. <laughs> Uh-oh. Thinking about raising your kids, mm -hmm. what was your favorite part about being a mother? Oh. What wasn't? I loved it. I loved every minute of it. My degree, which is not politically correct now, is the first one from Edinburgh University. The first year they awarded that degree, uh, they separated special ed and they had one for socially maladjusted and emotionally disturbed, which we now call emotional support class. And I student taught at the state hospital in the adolescent ward. But, and when we got married, they put that in the newspaper, that I was a socially maladjusted and emotionally disturbed teacher. 
That's how they printed it. And <laughs> Bill said, I said, I am going to have them go change the wording. They've got their adjectives. He goes, it's close enough. But anyways, I had read, you know, there was tons of psychology and behavior mod and all that involved with the classes for that. And I had decided that I was never going to let my kids go down that path. I was just going to be such a super mother that they were not going to have all of those things. And, and time and time again, while I tried to protect them from this, that, or the other thing, they didn't need it. Like I remember one time before we had Megan, so Emily must have been three and Bill had won a goldfish for her, two goldfish at the fair. And they lived in a little bowl on the kitchen table. And one day, I'm upstairs getting Emily dressed for church. Bill's downstairs, and he, we had a front and a back staircase. And he yells up the back staircase, I think Brownie bit the big one. And I said, yeah, I think? And he goes, no, really, yes has. I said, okay. So I'm messing with her. He goes, I'm just going to flush it down the toilet. I said, you can't do that. You know, we're going to damage your psyche. I just know we are. We, You can't do that. I said, we'll put it in a box. And we'll bury it out back after church. He goes, I'm just going to. And I said, no, we're going to blah. And uh, Abby, she's brushing her little tiny teeth. And she says, Ah, put it in a box and flush it down the toilet. I'm going to go watch cartoons. And I thought, well, there you have it. <laughs> Kid doesn't need all your crazy. She's coping just fine. So that's a great example. Yeah. What do you think was the hardest part about being a mother? Having to let them make their own mistakes when you knew you could prevent it if you could. Um, Megan was very stubborn. Bill could not deal with Emily. I could not deal with Megan because they were our own personalities. So I always did M. He goes, how can you talk her off a ledge? I said, I talk you off a ledge every day of your life. I'm used to it. Since... Bill's passing, what has been helping you get through the grief? I don't know. I don't think I'm, I don't think there's any through. I mean, Bill would say to me over and over, you know, in the last 10 years or so, or since he retired, I hope I never have to spend a day without you. And the kids said, you know, if you had gone first, daddy wouldn't be here now either. Because he just, he's, he would say to me, you're my best friend. You're all I need. And with COVID for two years, just be just us. I mean, I teased the kids and I'd say, they said, what are, what are you doing today? And I said, I'm being worshipped by your father. <laughs> I mean, he just, we were just soulmates. He was me and I was him. We never knew any time without each other, ever, ever. And it's just, I don't know. It's never going to be okay. <laughs> but I just get up every day and I think, you know what? God left me dangling around here for some reason. I don't particularly want to live to be 90, but everybody seems to. Um, I don't know. He was the youngest of our group of friends that we hung out together and everybody was really surprised. And, and all the kids that my kids grew up with, it was hard on them because it was always Mr. Bill and Mrs. T. Always, always, always. And they they got a real wake up that this could have been their parent. Mm -hmm. You know, one minute he's here, a day later he's not. And he'd never been sick. And it was just, I don't know. This is hard. It was hard on the girls being so far away. And the grandbabies, oh Lord, they made me tell them. Um, you know, they just 
loved their papa, loved him, and they still they still do. And I thought, okay, now you can do the crazy things he did, or you can just remind them of those. Because I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to become the go into the park and sitting in the hot sun and watching them get grimy grandma. That's not me. I will hire a neighborhood kid to go and do that. I know they need that. And, you know, if their parents don't come with them, then I, I send somebody to do that. But I, I just thought I'm still going to be me. And I've had to do that with everything. I mean, he, we had divided everything up so evenly that um, my only consolation is he wouldn't be able to wash a load of wash without me around either. Um, he tried that when I was I was pregnant with one of the girls that he washed something and he shrunk it and he turned his beautiful yellow linen pants pink because he didn't know what he was doing. So, or maybe he didn't know what he was doing. He never had to do wash again. I'm not <laughs> sure, but I don't know. We really divided up the labor and for the longest time, oh, I don't know, probably a year, a year and a half, I just resented having to do his chores. Because he loved to do, he would walk all over the neighborhood. He knew all kinds of people and he would go, you know, and talk to them. He lived in Warren all his life within a block of here, almost all his life. And to me, chores are just one more invasion into my sewing time or whatever. And you know, he'd go out in the morning and go to the post office and mail a package, complain about the cost. And then he'd go to get a steak at the grocery store in the afternoon. And then he might go pay a bill. And I'm like, no, you just do a circle. You get it all done at once. So you have a block of time. He said, what do I need a block of time for? You know, he'd sit there and I said, what are you thinking? And he goes, do I have to be thinking anything that I said I'm never not thinking <laughs> thousands of stuff and then I think he kind of used me for a memory bank you know I have a haircut at three o'clock well is it on the calendar you know I would but no you know mm -hmm. so you'll remind me mm -hmm. but I don't know it's hard not to have him though do you have any goals for yourself at this point in your life? No, I just keep on keeping on. I have a, being a United Methodist or a Methodist now, um, I have the John Wesley thing, do all the good that you can for all the people that you can for as long as you can. And that's what I do. And my mother-in-law said to me, if somebody calls and wants something, or need something, you stop everything and you do the person because the people are more important than the things. You know, if you decided that, well, today I'm going to dust the living room and somebody calls and they need a meal or they need an errand or they need a ride, then you dust the living room another time. That's going to sit and wait. And I learned a lot from Bill's mom, but she died even younger than Bill. Mm -hmm. She died. And she, she was the example I turned to. I, that was when I found out that when I met his mom and dad, I thought, oh, every family isn't as crazy as mine. You know, you don't have this screaming, shrill woman dictating how everything in the family is going to be. You have this reasonable person. And I thought, you can choose Oh, here's a phenomena. You can pick to be this way or you can continue. But I thought that's what a wife and mother did and was because I didn't really have much experience outside. Warren's a sheltered place to grow up. Really sheltered. I mean, the stuff I learned in college, it's like all my friends from Pittsburgh and stuff, they're saying, don't you know, don't you know? And I'm going, no, I don't know. It was just a different time. I'm mean, growing up in the 50s. My babysitters and stuff would, I mean, I, th I had one that smoked and she, I, well, I was 10 and she, she gave me a cigarette to try. I coughed and gagged, but I never had to worry about ever actually being tempted to do that. 
I'm sure my mom didn't know that Lillian did that. Should we uh, should we put a sticker on your manicure or just leave it uh, okay, plain? Okay, I barely got the manicure, so I think we should just leave, leave it, it plain. plain. Yes, okay. thank you anyways. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you want young people to know about growing older? In your head, you're never older. In your head... You're 21. I mean, I know in my head how Bill looked when he died. But when I think about him, he's that 19-year-old boy that married me. And his letters and his notes say that I was that girl. And, and that's all you need to know. If it's really real, then it works. And getting older isn't scary. I mean, but I but I can say that my friends have terrible arthritis. They're getting joints replaced. You know, I'm still sitting on my knees for hours cutting something out. I have good health, and so I don't really. I'm not scared of getting old. I I figure I'm one good fall from the girls slamming me in a nursing home because what can they do they live in atlanta so i say to myself well don't be stupid hang on to the railing every time you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just in case it's days before somebody figures out what went wrong <laughs> but how old are you 72 72 Looking back on your life, if you could sum your life up in one sentence, what would it be? I love people. All kinds of them. The weirder they are, the more I like them. <laughs> I think that's why I wanted the special ed. I mean, I just, I'm fascinated by them. I, lo I love to... To me, a good day would be sitting on a park bench in any city and just watching people trying to figure out what they're doing and why they're doing it. I don't know. I just, there's really, I don't think I've ever met a person that I didn't, met people I didn't understand, but not that I didn't want to know more about. That's really Nobody nice. Nobody ever asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're at the end of our manicure, and I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you today. I thank you for having me here and being so open with me. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening to Manny's with Grannies. I hope you enjoyed learning about someone else, and maybe even learned a little about yourself. 